Perfect. All right. So first and foremost, before I get started, I want to say a special thank you to Con Ed Institute for putting this day together. Uh, I've done two or three different events with them, and I'm a huge advocate for what you guys are doing, uh, making education very easily accessible. So thank you guys so much for having me here today. Uh, very excited about what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, before I get into abdominal detox or chine song, as we call it, and just for clarification right off the bat, I'll be using the two of those interchangeably. Uh, chine song and hara diagnosis. Uh, chine song is the Chinese version, hara diagnosis is the Japanese version. They're both abdominal detoxification. So I'll use those interchangeably. I uh, just want to get that out of the way so there's no confusion. Um, but, but yeah, before we start, I want to tell you guys a little bit about me. Um, we get information from so many different sources nowadays, uh, the internet being a huge one. And it's very difficult to tell what information is authentic and what's not authentic. So I think it's important you guys know a little bit about me before I start this talk. That's gonna, I think, um, give a little bit more validity to what I'm saying. And at least if you guys know a little bit about me, you know where the information is coming from. So I am a registered massage therapist. I've been practicing since 2004. Uh, I graduated from CCMH, so special shout out to anybody from CCMH who's watching right now. Um, after I graduated and became registered, I thought it was very important to take a business course. Uh, I really wanted to learn how to find my own business as opposed to always relying on clinics to find business for me. So I went to Seneca, took a course. First thing I did after I finished the course was start advertising myself. Uh, I did the yoga conference in 2000. I believe the first yoga conference was in 2005 or 2006, and I went, I promoted myself, and very proud to say I had the busiest uh, booth in the entire conference. That had nothing to do with my massage skills at the point at that point in time, but uh, I was the only massage therapist there. So I had big lineups, I did very, very well for myself, uh, and I was very thankful to do it. Um, after that, uh, the subsequent years, there was, I wasn't the only massage therapist there. Uh, because of my success, I guess there's other, businesses that decided it was a good place to advertise. So the next year I saw that there were shiatsu therapists there. Now, this was really interesting to me because what I learned in school was Swedish massage, which is Western and shiatsu is Eastern medicine. So the first thing I noticed right off the bat is they do treatment uh, sometimes on the table, sometimes on the ground. It's always through clothing. Uh, and it was a lot different from anything that I learned in school. So I was really fascinated by it and really wanted to learn it after seeing it. And so I went to the shiatsu school of Canada took a, a one week kind of basic course just to kind of dabble into it and see what it was all about. Uh, I really, really loved it, really enjoyed the course. And it was my first introduction to Chinese medicine uh, and their theories and how they differ from Western medicine. Um, so after that, uh, sorry, while I was in school studying Shiatsu, I think they briefly mentioned Hara diagnosis. Now Hara diagnosis, again, is the Japanese version of abdominal detoxification. Uh, I found it really fascinating because in massage, we're so quick to work on, you know, the legs, the arms, the neck, the shoulders, the whole body, but it's very rare we do any actual treatment to the abdomen. And when we do, I think the only, the only treatment that we learn in school is like a constipation treatment for the stomach. Beyond that, we don't really learn about the organs or how to treat them manually, even though they're all accessible to us. So I was really interested by hard diagnosis. Uh, I really wanted to study it, did some research, and the only place I could really find was in San Francisco, where they were teaching it. Uh, didn't really align with me at the time just to be able to travel and take the course. So uh, I, I kind of put it on a back burner. Uh, next couple of years doing the yoga conference, I saw that they had Thai massage. When I saw Thai massage, that was also a lot different because this is all movement based. Uh, the entire treatment, they're moving you through different positions, stretching you. Uh, I thought that was really great because also in Swedish massage, we have the person static for so much of the treatment. There's not very much movement. And for me, I'm an athlete. So movement is so important, stretching and maintaining flexibility. So uh, I was really drawn to that. Uh, I decided, you know, when I looked and I did the research and I saw that to learn in Toronto is actually very expensive. Uh, I found when I was doing my search, there was a school in Thailand that was teaching it. And the price of the course is actually very similar. If I were to fly there, accommodate myself and take the course, it was similar to the same price. Uh, if I stayed here and did level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, that's kind of how they advertise Thai massage here, uh, or at least they did at the time. So I flew out to Thailand. Uh, I've gone three different times to learn and study. And the first time I went, I was walking down the street 
and I saw a sign and that sign was pretty much the splitting image of the picture I have on the screen right now uh, with the abdomen and all the colors kind of lit up. Um, I saw that and it looked like horror diagnosis to me because I didn't know what Chine Song was at the time. So I walked into the school, asked them what it was all about, and they described to me what I knew horror diagnosis as being. Uh, that's all it took. Signed up for the course, took the course. I uh, went to a variety of different schools, learned from different teachers, different masters, just to be well-rounded. And I haven't really looked back. Um, for me, Chine Song is one of the best types of hands-on. I think it actually is the best hands-on form of therapy that exists. Uh, if something is wrong with your back, with your neck, with your shoulders, with your your ankles, your legs, that's not something that's really life altering, right? If you have a little bit of discomfort, that's not life altering. But if there's a problem with your organs and how they function, that is something that could be uh, life altering. So to have a therapy where you can actually address these things, I think it's really important. And I think it's something that more people should know about. And that's why I'm here talking about it today. So I should start by saying, what is Chine Song? Uh, as you can see under Chine Song, they're on the left, internal organ energy massage. Okay, Chine Song is, a, I'll say it again, internal organ energy massage. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're massaging the internal organs directly. Uh, that word energy is a little bit of a touchy one for me. I'm leaving that till the very end to speak about because I think in all honesty, it's one of the most important things, um, but we'll get there. Uh, so again, if we think about massage and we think of somebody who has back pain, okay? Most people in my clinic who come to me for treatment, they come for back pain or they come for shoulder pain. Now, we do the assessments as normal and we begin treating. Why do people get so much relief from massages? Well, the main reason is that when we're massaging, we're doing long strokes. We're bringing a lot of oxygen rich blood flow to the area. Uh, not only oxygen, but all the nutrients that our body needs to heal. We're just increasing the amount of blood flow to the area. In doing so, we're also removing toxins that have accumulated and become stagnant in that area. Um, that's one of the main effects of massage. Uh, the other thing is that we create drag when we're moving tissue. So as we know, fascia, uh, it's connective tissue that surrounds pretty much every structure in our body. So when you create drag, you're breaking down fascial restrictions. Okay, when you break down fascial restrictions, you're working not only on the fascia, but you're working on distortion and postural dysfunction. Uh, that's the main reason that we get benefits. If we're keeping it simple, that's one of the main reasons that people feel better after a massage. Uh, well, through our stomach, we can palpate all our organs. Right? We can palpate directly the small intestine, the large intestines, the liver, and the stomach. So if we can massage the back, neck, and shoulders, why not massage the organs directly? You're gonna get all the same benefits of helping them to detoxify. And since our organs are responsible for detoxifying our body, I'm gonna say it's, it's most important that we detoxify them directly, okay? Uh, now when we talk about Chine Song, there's four different aspects to the treatment. The first one is the physical, and that's what we're gonna spend the most time talking about because everybody will understand the physical uh, component of it. Uh, the second part is the emotional. And for me, when I'm speaking about things that are based on Eastern medicine, I always like to describe it in Western terms. And the reason being is I think there's a bit of a divide between East and Western medicine. There's a lot of people in Western medicine who dismiss Eastern medicine because they don't know the science behind it or they don't understand it. They think it's something magical or mystical uh, and they don't really know the science behind it. So I'm gonna try and explain the scientific part behind it so you guys can understand. Um, the emotional, the wind release and the energetic. For wind and energetic, you need a little bit more of a background in Chinese medicine. But again, I'm gonna do my best to explain that to you guys so it makes sense. Okay, so we'll start out with the physical. So as I said before, we have four organs that are very easily palpable in the stomach. Okay, small intestines, large intestines, liver, and stomach. Um, the first thing we're gonna do with any treatment is we're gonna address the small intestines. Uh, as you can see from the picture on the left there, the small intestines take up the majority of our abdomen. Uh, interesting side note, in horror diagnosis, the Japanese version of abdominal detoxification, the masters believe that we should be able to push into our stomach and palpate our spine pretty easily. So I'll say that one more time. The, in a horror diagnosis, they think that their theory is that we should be able to push into the stomach and very easily touch the spine. Now, the, it sounds kind of crazy to us when I say it at first, right? But if we really think about it, the tissues in our abdomen are all soft tissue, right? Our colon is soft, our blood vessels are soft. Everything that's in front of our spine is all soft tissue. So it doesn't sound so crazy anymore when we think about it. 
So why can't we do so? The reason is, as far as they see it, is that we have a lot of toxic buildup in those organs. Um, so the first thing that they always want to start doing is working on the small intestine. And some masters actually won't do anything else. They won't work on any other organ until they've successfully cleared out the small intestines. Okay. When we work on the small intestine, the main thing that we're looking to do is break down what they call knots and tangles. So a knot and a tangle, you can think of as a trigger point if you, if you want. It's the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that a knot is more superficial, whereas a tangle is deeper. Now, because a tangle is deeper, uh, when you have a tangle, it intertwines different layers of tissue. So in a tangle, you'll find lymphatic vessels that are caught in it. You'll find blood vessels. You'll find nervous tissue and also fascia. So if you have a tangle and you have lymph vessels um, wrapped up in it, then that's going to affect the flow of lymph. If you got blood vessels, that's going to affect the blood flow in the area, trying to detoxify that area. If you have nervous tissue, that's going to affect the innervation. And of course, we talked about fascia is going to pull and distort and drag things out of position. And uh, that's a very common thing with our organs, that our organs are actually pulled and dragged out of position. Uh, and I'll touch on that a little bit more uh, in a minute. But the knots and the tangles is what we're really looking to treat when we're addressing the small intestine. Now, I'll share a personal story of when I was in Thailand and I was getting treatment for one of my masters. Um, I was doing the advanced course and in the advanced course, this sounds scary guys, but I want you to know that pressure determines on your, is determined by your therapist. So when I say that she had me on the ground and she had her feet in my stomach, it doesn't always have to be uncomfortable. I use my feet in people's stomach quite a bit. And the reason I use my feet and like using it more than my hands and elbows sometimes is because it's more broad contact, right? So it's more about broad contact than actual depth and pressure. Uh, but anyways, when I was in Thailand, I was getting a treatment for my small intestine. Um, actually, that's, that's what she was focusing on with this specific technique. So she hit a point in my abdomen that was really, really, really uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not going to use the word pain because when she hit that point, as uncomfortable as it was, I really wanted her to keep going. I could feel there was something there that needed to be worked on. So I just dealt with the discomfort as she pushed. Now, she was pushing on that point for about a solid six, seven minutes. Uh, I'm not exaggerating, six, seven minutes, foot in my stomach, really, really uncomfortable. And after six minutes, something happened that freaked me out. I heard a loud popping noise. Now, when I say a loud popping noise, I want you guys to think about someone popping a balloon. It wasn't quite that loud, but it was loud enough that it was, I'll be honest, it was disturbing at the time. I was a student, I had no idea what happened. And that sound is not comfortable when it comes from inside your stomach. So uh, I look up her, at her thinking, you know, something bad has happened. And she's looking back down with a huge smile on her face. And I say, okay, so I'm not gonna die of internal bleeding or anything. She says, no, that was one of the tangles releasing. Now, I forgot to mention that at that time I had lower back pain. And as soon as she hit that point with her heel in my stomach, I felt that lower back pain. After that treatment, that back pain was gone. And furthermore, if I sat cross-legged, I would have kind of if I ever sat with my left leg crossed over my right leg, my left knee would be really high up in the air. My right one could drop down. I had lots of range of motion there, but my left one never had that range of motion. After that treatment, my left knee dropped so much further. My hips were much more open. I had much more range of motion. My back pain was gone. And I had, uh, I don't know if you guys ever had when you get a massage and you get up and you just feel like a weight's been lifted on you. So I had that sensation where my stomach, it just felt so much lighter uh, and so much more breathable. So I want to share that experience because this, there's a lot of things about this treatment that are a little bit different from treatments we're, we're used to giving. Um, and uh, oh, just a comment on that picture on the right. So when we're working on the small and large intestine, we know that the inside of the intestines are not smooth, right? They're very rigid inside. So there's lots of space where food particles can get trapped, where air particles can get trapped. That's where we end up having backlogs or blockages in our colon. And that's one of the things that we're really working to remove and release through this treatment. Uh, typically, after we work on the small intestine, the next thing we're going to go to is the large intestine. Okay, The large intestines are palpable for the most part. There's some parts we can't palpate. But our large intestine, as we know, it goes up the right side, right? The ascending colon goes up the right side, goes slightly underneath the rib cage, uh, also on the kind of the deep portion of the liver. It folds on itself, goes across transverse colon, 
folds on itself again, and then goes down for the descending colon. Now, the main areas we're gonna have problems with the large intestine are under those folds. So right underneath the right side and the left side of the rib cage, those are called the hepatic, uh, the hepatic flexure and the splenic flexure. So if we start with the hepatic on the right side, right underneath the liver, that's an area because of the fold and because of that rigidity that we see in that right side of the picture, that's an area where a lot of food and air particles get trapped. So we can't directly palpate that part of the large intestines, but there's a lot that we can do to release it and to release all the food particles that do get trapped in there. So the way we do that is by working the superficial tissues. There's some techniques that penetrate and are very effective, but by working the superficial tissues, we can actually help release that. So any problem that we have in the body, the response is gonna be for the musculature and the area to tighten over it. That's our body's defense mechanism. So I don't know why this is the best example I can find or I always give people, but I like to use analogies. If, uh, if you were to get into a fight with somebody, you're probably not gonna stand there nice and relaxed. You're gonna tense up so that if they hit you, you can absorb the shock, right? That's a protective mechanism. The same thing when you have a problem with your organ or any other part of the body for that, for that matter, right? That area is gonna tighten up all the muscles, all the fascia and connective tissue in that area are gonna tighten up as a protective mechanism to keep you away from it. So just by palpating that area, if it's really tight, we can tell there's a little bit of an issue there. Uh, we can effectively work on that by loosening all the superficial tissues, like I said. And if you think about the location there, right under the rib cage, that means that what's gonna happen is the intercostals are gonna be tight. The uh, ribs are not gonna have as much mobility. And even part of the liver you're gonna find in that area is a bit tight and doesn't have any motion or uh, any give when you push in that area. So we work, to, we work to mobilize the ribs. We work to loosen up the intercostal muscles. And we work on the area of the large intestine that leads up to that area, to that flexure. Uh, the one technique that we can do that's very effective um, directly to that area is do vibrations over there. If you do vibrations, that'll shake the inside of the colon and it'll actually shake a lot of the stuff that's trapped up in there. Okay. Uh, that's mainly what we're looking to do in the large intestine, both at the hepatic flexure and on the other side, the splenic flexure. Uh, the other major area we're looking at with the large intestine is the ileocecal valve. So the ileocecal valve is where food from the small intestine goes into the large intestine. And oftentimes that valve gets, uh, gets a little bit congested and backlogged. So there's techniques where we go right just above the inguinal area, uh, where we're working to kind of encourage food to move through there and encouraging that valve to open back up. Uh, another personal story I'll share is, um, I had one client come to me. So the other thing that we do with this therapy is not only cleaning out the organs, but we also reposition them. I had one client come to me and I was doing work on their abdominals. Okay. I started working on cleaning out their large intestines because their large intestines were pretty backlogged. Now, one of the things that can happen with the, with the large intestine is that it can fill up with so much uh, kind of a backlog of food particles. Sorry, guys, you're going to hear me talk a lot about fecal matter, but it's impacted fecal matter that gets trapped in the colon. And as a result, if too much of it gets trapped, it actually weighs down the large intestine. And what happens is it'll fall out to the side, right? And give you love handles. So I was treating this one client and after the treatment, I did some work to uh, clean out the large intestine. I also did some work to reposition the large intestine. And afterwards, I hadn't even noticed. They got off the table, looked in the mirror and were in shock. They asked me, what did you do? What did you do? I said, what happened? They said, I don't have love handles. And it's only then that I looked at them and realized that the love handle they had had actually, we, we repositioned their large intestines successfully and they didn't have love handles anymore. Now, this is not my way of saying that anybody who has love handles can come and get treatment and in one treatment, we're gonna get rid of them. Doesn't always work like that, uh, but it does work like that sometimes. And I've actually been able to do that for two different people. And it's, it's really amazing when you get those results in the treatment because you're not going and expecting something like that, but it does happen. Uh, after that, we're going to typically work on, so that's the small intestine and the large intestine, and we don't really do this treatment in a routine. After you learn, you kind of work on what needs to be worked on, um, but I'm going to, just for the sake of this talk, break it down as if it was a routine, okay? Typically, after small intestines and large intestine, you're going to go into the liver and the gallbladder. The liver sits under the right side of the rib cage, just beneath the uh, ribs, so you can actually palpate that. You can take your fingers, you can sink down, and you can go up and under. 
And again, guys, it doesn't mean that it's uncomfortable for everybody. It really depends on your palpation skills and how you approach the technique. But I do this on anybody I do Chine Song and I go underneath their rib cage and it's, you can get pretty far up under there if there's not any real problems. If there are problems, uh, generally your body won't want you to go up in, in there, right? There's a lot of restrictions. But when you go and you palpate that area, you can feel where the restrictions are within the organ. Um, what it feels like is just a hardened area. So you'll feel kind of soft, 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 and you'll feel a little nodule that's hard. Again, similar to like trigger points, right? You can work on a muscle band and then you hit an area that's a trigger point and you're gonna notice that area is a little bit harder, a little bit rougher than the other areas. Um, you're also gonna notice that some areas, uh, they feel granular, it's almost like sand. So those are the areas that we need to work out and we do little spiraling techniques to, again, just improve blood flow to that area, remove the sedimentation and toxins that build up in that part of the liver. Um, the next thing we'll do is we'll work on the gallbladder and let's see. So the gallbladder, uh, one common problem that people have is, um, um, what are they called? Gallstones. So gallstones are something that are, are pretty common. I know I have a couple of friends who've actually had gallstone attacks where you just get sharp, sharp pain in your stomach. It's not a lot of fun. Um, in Chine Song, one of the things that we do is we clear the bile ducts. So if you were to put one finger on your xiphoid process, your sternum. So for anybody who's not a therapist, the center of your chest right down at the bottom where your rib cage is in the middle. You put one finger there and you put one finger on the side of your body. So the right side, right below where your last rib is. If you draw a line between those two fingers, right in the center is where your gallbladder is tucked in under the liver. If we push in there, we can do spiraling techniques. So it's a massage technique where you push down and you make little circles going down towards the belly button. And what that's gonna do is it's effectively gonna to start to move the bile from the gallbladder down the bile duct into the small intestine. Um, that's something that we can use to clear that area out. So if there is any congestion of bile stuck in the bile ducts, then we can effectively start to move it through the bile duct. Uh, so those are typically the techniques that we're gonna use for the organs that are palpable. Uh, we can also palpate the stomach. So we're gonna treat that in the same way that we treat the liver. We're just gonna go slightly under the rib cage. We're gonna circle, we're gonna feel for any areas of kind of granulation and we're gonna work that out. Apart from that, we're gonna work on the heart. Uh, the heart, we work through its reflex points. We don't work on it directly, of course. And this is probably a good time to talk about sedimentation buildup in blood vessels. So when we work the heart reflex, that's just inferior to the xiphoid process. When you, push on the, when you push on that reflex, you're actually pushing on the aorta. Now, I want everybody to visualize a tube, like a garden hose, spewing out water. If you step on the garden hose, no water is going to come out anymore, but there'll be a lot of backlog of pressure. Well, if you push halfway down on that hose, what's going to happen is water is going to shoot out at a lot higher velocity. Uh, much more pressurized water is going to come out. Uh, what's going to happen on the other end is that there's going to be a buildup because all the water can't pass through. There's going to be a buildup of pressure on the other side of that hose. When we push in our blood vessels, we do the same. So there's techniques where you push on, on arteries and you're only pushing about halfway down very gently and it's gonna create pressure. So the blood that is flowing through it comes out pressurized, right? And that's gonna remove the sedimentation that's built up in the blood vessels. Uh, the other effect of course, is that the backup of blood backs up into the organ and that pressure builds and builds and builds as more and more blood flow fills up into that organ. When you remove that pressure, all that blood flow goes out and it carries the toxins away with it. So that's how some of the reflexes work. We work on the reflexes that way. We also do it through uh, working on their meridians. Again, because this is based on, on Chinese medicine. Um, we'll do the heart. We'll do that for the pericardium. We'll do that for the spleen. And the next one I wanna talk about is an issue that I see quite a bit as well. I have a lot of people calling me asking about, uh, which is infertility. So there are things that we can do for infertility. Um, for lack of, a, of better wording, uh, I, it's very difficult for any massage therapists out there. Some things are very difficult to explain what you feel, right? Sometimes you feel something when you're working on a client, but you have a hard time putting it into words. So the best way I can describe what I feel is probably not the best way of putting it, but it's, it's what gives people the visual to make them understand. Uh, anybody who I've treated who has issues with infertility, when I push in their stomach, it feels like, and 
again, I apologize to anybody if this sounds insensitive. It's just for educational purposes so you can understand. Uh, when I push in people's stomachs and they have fertility issues, it feels like their organs are wrapped in a straitjacket. It feels like when you push in their stomach, there is absolutely no give. It just pushes you right back out. Uh, and that's been common in everybody who I've worked on who complains of fertility issues. So for anybody who wants to know, for any lady who wants to know where your ovaries, where your uterus are, if you were to make a triangle with your hand, okay, so hopefully, I can't see myself, hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing with my hands here. If you make this triangle and you put the thumbs over the belly button, the index fingers where they meet, that's where your uterus is, and the pinkies, that's where your ovaries are. Okay, so again, the thumbs go over the belly button, umbilicus, the index fingers where your uterus is, the small fingers are where your ovaries are. Where the ovaries are is an area that often gets compressed because of uh, unhealthy small intestines, right? They get backlogged with food, that weight presses on the ovaries, it cuts off its blood supply. The ovaries quite literally dry out, and then that's not proper breeding grounds for pregnancy anymore. So the techniques we use are to direct more blood flow into that area to loosen up all the restrictions in the area and detoxify it so blood can start flowing back in to the ovaries. Hey, um, Andre? Yes. Yeah. Your camera wasn't on when you were showing that last piece, so we actually oh. couldn't see you. Okay, so anybody, if you guys literally make a, for anybody who does push-ups where they put their hands underneath their chest and you put your hands together, you're gonna make a triangle with your thumb and your index fingers, and then you're gonna lay your thumb over your belly button. At the end, when we're doing questioning, I'll, I'll come on camera so you guys can see me. But if you do, uh, if you ever do those push-ups where you put your hands underneath you, put the hands together, your thumbs are gonna to touch, your index fingers are gonna to touch, and your hands are gonna be closed. And you're gonna put the thumbs overneath the belly button, and where your index fingers are is where your uterus is, and where your pinkies are is where your ovaries are. And again, guys, I'll go over at the end so you can see me. So I'll show you one more time at the end. Um, the uterus as well, we can go in and we can start to manipulate the uterus. So it's very common for the uterus to fall out of position. Um, I had a teacher when I was in Thailand and she asked me to do some work on her uterus. She pulled me aside and she says, uh, I want you to do something for me. I said, sure, no problem. She's like, I want you to reposition my uterus. I'm like, okay, I have no idea how to do that, but I'll try. And she says, I'll tell you what to do and you do it. So the problem that we that a lot of ladies have with the uterus, especially uh, as they get a little bit older, is oftentimes the uterus will drop. Okay, so people who have a dropped uterus or a shifted uterus, the uterus will also shift to the left or to the right. It's very common. If you look in the mirror, if you lie on your back uh, and you just look at your stomach or if you look in the mirror and you have a bump on either the left or right side of your abdomen, the lower part of the abdomen, one side is a little bit higher than the other. That's usually because your uterus is shifted out of position. So this uh, teacher of mine, she asked me to do a couple techniques to reposition it. And it was painful. It was uncomfortable for her. But she came back the next day and she was, she was thrilled. She said, I fixed it. So again, I don't know what I did. I just did exactly what she told me to. But uh, that's when I was a student. Now, now I know that there's techniques that you can do to actually go in there, scoop the uterus and start to move it and reposition it. So again, it's not just physically manually working through the organs, you're actually working to reposition uh, organs that have fallen out of position, okay? That's pretty much it for the physical aspect. So I'm gonna move on to the emotional aspect. Um, the emotional aspect. So uh, in Western medicine, they're starting to look at the uh, digestive system as a second brain. Uh, the reason being is the enteric nervous system works independently of the central nervous system. Uh, that's to say it works independently of the brain and the spinal cord. It doesn't need them to do its work. So if that's true, if that can work independently of our brain, that means it's our second mind. It's got a mind of its own. So in that sense, our organs are going to have effect on our emotional state of well-being. So in Western terms, if we look at this picture right here, okay, we have a depressed person. Now, if you think of a depressed person, you never think about somebody standing up tall with their shoulders back. You think of somebody who's slumped over, kind of like the, the image that I have there, okay? If somebody's slumped over and they have poor posture, that means their lungs can't properly expand. If your lungs can't expand, you're not gonna get enough oxygen or as much oxygen in. If you're not getting as much oxygen, that means your blood pressure is going to rise and your heart rate is going to increase. Okay? Those two things stimulate your sympathetic nervous system, which leads to more anxiety, 
which leads to more depression. That's the feedback loop and it's self-perpetual, okay? So if we're able to work on the emotional state of well-being, that person's depression, it's gonna help their organs. If we're able to help the lungs to expand more, that's gonna help the depression. So the two work together. Our emotions affect our organs and our organs affect our emotions, okay? Another way to look at it in Western terms is if we think of indigestion, okay? If you're a chatty individual and you like to socialize and you're at a party and you're suffering from indigestion, you're probably not gonna be as social as you normally would, right? So that's just another example of how your organs are gonna affect your mood. If you have indigestion, something's wrong with the colon, you're probably not gonna be in a great mood. Um, I wanna explain that in Eastern terms too, because as I said, this, this, um, the theory for this treatment is mostly Chinese medicine based. So I wanna explain a little bit of Chinese medicine. Um, for anybody who doesn't really believe in it or understand it, uh, the reason that I'm so fascinated by it is because it's withstood the test of time. So we see fads come and go nowadays, right? Fads come every year and they go just as quickly. Um, but if something withstands the test of time, there's got to be something valid about it. There's got to be something about it that works. Otherwise, people would stop using it or stop doing it. So Chinese medicine dates back, depending on who you ask or your resource for information, because they don't really know, uh, but dates back anywhere from 400 to 3000 BC, okay? Uh, the two major books, the Tao Te Ching is a Taoist book. So Chinese medicine came from Taoism or Taoism. And the two main books, the Tao Te Ching and the Yellow Emperor of Classic Medicine, um, sorry, the Yellow Emperor of Classic of Medicine. Those are the two main books for Chinese medicine and for Taoism, okay? Um, the way they came up with their theories is back in the day, the sages, the Tao sages would spend hours and hours, years of, they, years of their life they would dedicate to meditation. Now we have our senses, our five senses, and we always use them for external stimuli, okay? We look out at the world with our eyes, we listen with our ears to external noises. What they did in meditation was they turned those senses inward, okay? They'd sit in meditation, they'd close their eyes and they'd look inside their body. They would quiet their mind and they'd listen to what happened inside of their body. <clears throat> And they realized there were a lot of things that you can feel and sense that are going on in your body when you do that. So for anybody who, you can, you can feel, first of all, your heartbeat, you can feel how blood moves through your body, you can feel energy and how energy moves through your body. Now for anybody who doesn't believe that, all you have to do is one simple exercise that'll prove it. Uh, right now, everybody's listening to me. So you're not paying attention to your heartbeat. But if you took just one minute to quiet your mind and pay attention to your heart, close your eyes, every one of you guys would be able to feel your heartbeat. So that's just from one minute of quieting your mind that you can feel that. Imagine spending years and years of meditation and plugging into your body and what's going on. Not only would they do that in meditation, but then they would also go into meditation, and observe the outer world. They'd observe their environment. And what they came to notice was that the things that exist in nature also exist in our body. So uh, fire, water, metal, they all exist in nature. They exist in our body. Metal exists in our body as minerals. Water covers 70% of the planet. And I think it's more than 70% of our body and fire exists in nature. Well, we operate on electrical impulses and electricity, which is heat, which is fire. It's the same thing. So the things that they noticed in nature also exist in our body. They came to talk about our body and the universe around us as a microcosm and a macrocosm. The macrocosm is the outer world, the world as we know it, the universe, the stars, the cosmos, and that's its own universe. Our body is a microcosm. It's its own small universe consisting of all the elements in nature. And not to mention, we have a life that lives in our body. We have tons and tons and tons of life that lives inside of our body as much as we Maybe don't think about it that way often. Um, <clears throat> through all this med years of meditation and study, they came up with the five elements chart. Okay. So the five elements, it builds relationships. All these different relationships between our body and between the outer world and nature. So if we look at the first column where I have wood, okay, we look at liver. The emotion for liver is anger. So everybody's heard of an angry drunk before, right? The liver has to detoxify when we drink alcohol. Um, that's that the liver corresponds with anger. So when the liver's stressed, people experience anger. 
Uh, let's look at the last column where we have the kidney. Okay, the kidney is paired with the urinary bladder, so the bladder, and its emotion is fear. If we think of uh, an experience where somebody's frightened, where they're terrified suddenly out of the blue, often they lose control of their bladder and they wet themselves. So that's just another example of how our emotions and our, uh, our, our emotional state of well-being and our organs tie into each other. Now, I added the picture on the right there, honestly, just because I love this picture. Um, <clears throat> it's a picture of the large intestine, the colon, and it's a picture of the different parts of the large intestine that emotions affect. So just to go one step deeper into this stuff, if we look at the picture, the red picture, that red face, we see an individual who's angry. Now, I thought anger was supposed to be from the wood element, which is affecting the liver. So how come I have a picture of a colon where anger affects the colon? Uh, it goes back to what I was speaking about earlier, that if we have a problem in the body, everything in that area tightens up to protect us. So that part, that red part um, of the colon, that actually attaches, it touches the inner portion of the liver. So if the liver is a problem in that area, then the colon, which attaches to it, is going to be a problem. Anger is going to be a problem. There's all these different things that connect, that lead us uh, down a path of showing us where all the problems are. Okay. Uh, So when we're doing Chine Song, we're not only treating the physical, we're also treating the emotional state of well-being. The two go hand in hand. Uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is wind. Okay, and this one I'm going to keep brief because you really do need a little bit of a background in Chinese medicine to understand it. But um, I'm still going to touch on it because it's one of the things that we treat very frequently in uh, Chine Song. So just as we said before, wind exists in the external environment, which means it's got to exist in our body too. Wind can be a nice cool breeze on a summer day, or it can be as disruptive as a tornado or a hurricane. Um, examples of wind we mentioned before, indigestion, right? You can have air pockets trapped in your colon, which push out in your colon, making it very uncomfortable. Um, we can also talk about wind if we think about a stroke. So if you inject just a tiny little bit of air where it's not supposed to be in a blood vessel, that'll travel up to your brain, give you a stroke, and most likely kill you, right? So air, wind can be very destructive. Luckily, we don't often find air in our blood vessels, but we do find it in the body. In the West, we think of it being in our digestive system, uh, but in the East, they say it's all over your body. And it's one of the trickier ones because it can travel, it can move around and it can hide. Uh, wind would be destructive because wind carries currents. If we think about outside on a hot day, right? Wind carries currents of heat. It carries moisture and humidity. Uh, it can do the opposite and carry cold, right? So we all know about that in Toronto, if you're in Toronto, because of the wind chill. Okay, we have a, a pretty brutal wind chill up here. So when it's windy outside, it feels much, much colder. Uh, our internal organs, they all operate on a very specific temperature and level of moisture. If that's interrupted, then the organ can't operate properly or can't function properly. So if we think about um, our reproductive system, for example, uh, it's supposed to be cooler than the rest of our body. If there's too much wind in the body carrying heat, then it can disrupt that balance and give us problems with our, with our reproductive organs. Um, if we look on the left, I have something that says Chine Song points, and the picture is actually acupuncture points. Uh, most of the Chine Song points are the same as acupuncture points, although there are a few different ones. And these are areas where we can release wind from the body. So another thing that makes me so interested by Chinese medicine is just the level of depth and knowledge. Uh, there's 365 different acupuncture points in the body. The number sound familiar to anybody? 365? Same amount of days in the year. Okay. Uh, I know some people who do acupuncture and didn't know that each acupuncture point also corresponds to a different constellation. So I haven't done too much research into that. Anybody who does want to do some research or anybody who knows about that, by all means, hit me up. That's something I really want to dive into further because I find it really, really fascinating. But there's so many different levels to Chinese medicine and how many things you can learn if you study it. Uh, and that's one of the things that keeps me fascinated because no matter how much I learn, there's still more to learn. And I'm always a student when it comes to this stuff. Okay. Um, so again, these, these Chine Song points are areas where we can release wind from the body. Uh, 
there's five main points that we work in Chine Song to start a treatment. So we open up these five different portals before we go and we say we work in the small intestine, like I said. Uh, so two points in the ankle, two points in the chest for anybody who does acupuncture, that the two lung points just inferior to the uh, chromioclavicular joint. And the next thing we do is we work in the umbilicus. So in Taoism, they look at the umbilicus a lot differently than we do in the West. Uh, when we're born, the umbilicus is our, it's our kind of lifeline, right? That's how we get all of our nutrients from our mother. Uh, that's cut and you're on your own, right? As far as they see it in Taoism, even though the umbilicus gets cut, that's still an area where we can release uh, toxins from our body. So I'll tell you another personal story, which is kind of gross if I'm being honest. Uh, the master in Thailand who I trained with, one of them, she told me that anytime you work on the umbilicus, put a layer over it. It could be a towel, it could be a sheet, could be anything, but put something over it. Because when you push in there, things may come out. So she's had clients, she says, where she pushes in the umbilicus and sludge or mucus actually comes out of their belly button. So that just speaks to the fact that toxins can be released to the belly button. I thankfully have not had that happen before, but uh, I just thought it was really interesting. So I wanted to throw it in there. Uh, the umbilicus is also very important from the standpoint of it being our center. Okay. Since it's our center, it affects everything above it and everything below it. Now, I put some, some of these pictures in uh, just to highlight the importance of our center. So if we look at the smallest thing, I'm going to scroll back a couple slides, the smallest thing in that bottom picture there, right? That's an atom. You have a center nucleus and electrons circulating it. Well, without that center, there wouldn't be the magnetism to hold that electron in orbit. Okay, so that's the smallest thing we think of an atom. If we think on a much larger scale, then we can look at our, our solar system. Okay, our solar system, we have the sun in the middle and we've got all these planets circling around it. Well, without the sun, first of all, no life on earth would exist. No trees would grow, there'd be no animals, we'd have nowhere to get energy from. Okay, the planets also wouldn't be in orbit because again of the magnetism of the sun keeping all the planets in orbit. Okay, you remove the sun, you have no life. You remove the earth and the sun goes on. So that's just to speak to the importance of our center. In the human body, if you have a problem, let's use the liver one since I brought that up a couple times before. If you have a problem with your liver, the fascia, the connective tissue is all gonna pull to the right. It's gonna pull towards the liver. Well, because we know fascia is connected, every, it surrounds every muscle, every tendon, ligament, bone. It surrounds everything in our body. So if in our center, it's pulling to the right, that means above that area is going to pull to the right. Below that area is going to pull to the right. If we go above that area, not only is it going to pull right, it's going to pull down towards the problem. And if we go, go below, it's going to pull right and it's going to pull up. So sometimes when we have a problem in the body as therapists, we always look at that one area where they feel the pain, but we don't look at the body as a whole, right? So any problem in the center is not only going to affect the center, but it can affect areas that are far away from the center, up in the shoulders, down in the feet. And there's many treatments I've done where I'm working in someone's shoulder and they feel a neck pain that they have, right? Uh, so I see people and they have neck pain and I work on their neck and then I always insist that I do a little bit of chini song and start working in their stomach. And I start working on their stomach and I hit a point and they say, oh, my neck, my neck, the exact same pain that they came in complaining of. So again, the, the center is so important. I think this is something that really, really does need to be worked in every treatment. Um, Miss anything. So that's the wind. And this is just to speak to pulls. Okay, the umbilicus is gonna pull and point to the direction of where the problem is. If you see the picture on the top left, you're gonna see that pulls up to the right. That's a liver problem. Okay, all the fascia is recruiting it. If you see the picture in the top right, it's pulling straight upward. That usually indicates something with the heart. The bottom left picture, is a kidney picture, so it's pulling side to side. And the bottom right picture, I swear, guys, that's me. That's what my stomach looks like. All right, last part we're gonna talk about. We talked about the physical, we talked about the emotional, we talked about wind. The last thing, most important to me, is talking about the energy components of the treatment. So we are all energy, okay? We know that because there's electrical impulses that are constantly traveling up and down our body. If somebody touches you, you feel 
you feel it because there's an elect electrical impulse going up that nerve into your spinal column, up into your brain for you to interpret it. If you're cold, it's the same idea. An electrical impulse is going from your skin up to your brain for you to interpret it. Any movement that you make, your brain initiates a nerve impulse, which goes down your spinal cord, shocking muscles to make you contract that area. So there's constantly energy going up and down our body. Okay. That's the Western, that's in Western terms. We already know that. Okay. We also have an aura, which they talk about in Western medicine too. An aura is just the amount of heat that our body gives off. It's like a little cocoon. So if you look at the picture I have in the bottom left there, you see a light bulb that the part that's lit up is that light bulb aura. That's the, that's the amount of heat it gives off. So if you're anywhere within that cocoon, you can feel that heat. Well, our body has the same thing. We, our body's electricity, so it gives off heat, which means it has a cocoon around it. We have an aura. Now you can't feel that aura, right? You can't feel that aura? What if I told you you could? What if I told you that all the energy practitioners, their training helps them to be able to feel that aura? Well, I'm gonna tell you from firsthand experience, you can feel it, okay? That's what practices like Tai Chi and Qigong are all about. Um, I've been doing Chine Song for a number of years now, and I will say that when I started doing Tai Chi and Qigong uh, with a, a master that I found here in Toronto, he's a Shaolin monk, so he's, he's the real deal. Ever since I started doing that, my practice went to another level. I was doing this treatment all along, working on the physical and emotional stuff and doing wind release, not even realizing the energetic components of it. Uh, but as soon as I started doing Tai Chi and Qigong and being able to feel and manipulate energy, my treatments got so much better and so much more effective. Now, this, is, this stuff sounds really crazy, guys. I know it's, uh, you can feel energy, right? It sounds really weird, sounds crazy. Most people have a hard time believing it. Uh, I had a hard time believing it. You know, I read all the books and learned about it, but I never actually experienced it firsthand until I met this master and started training with him. So uh, I understand that this stuff sounds a little bit strange, but again, I'm going to do my best to explain it. Okay. Um, anybody who's ticklish out there, they should understand this analogy pretty well. For somebody who's really ticklish, you can get tickled and tickled and, you know, you, you, you get to a point where you become so sensitive that if somebody comes anywhere close to you, you may not see them. They may not even actually touch you. But if somebody puts their finger really close to you, you pull away because you can feel a sensation there. But they're not touching you. So why do you feel that sensation? It's the energy that they give off. That's them coming into your aura. That's them disturbing the energy that your body's giving off. And that's why you pull away. I'm very ticklish. So I've had that. Uh, I felt that as a kid often. I never really knew what it was until um, I started doing Tai Chi and Qigong. So I'm gonna explain very quickly, very briefly, uh, some things about Qigong. But first and foremost, I wanna mention that I think everybody who does uh, therapy should be doing some sort of energy practice. And the reason being is that when you're treating, you are exchanging energy with people. Whether you believe it or not, you're exchanging energy with people. Um, if your energy levels are very high, then you are exchanging healing energy with people. Uh, things go by a concentration gradient. So they go from high to low. So if your energy levels are higher than the person you're treating, then positive healing energy goes into that client. If you are treating somebody and their energy levels are higher than yours, then you may be taking their healing energy from them. Uh, I've seen many therapists who over, over the years, as they get a little bit older, their health starts to deteriorate. <clears throat> And I believe that to be because they're not doing any energy practices because they spend years and years and years of, of giving and giving and giving and not enough time receiving. Uh, so we, we often pick up sick energy from our clients. If somebody comes in and they're really sick and you touch them, again, if your energy levels aren't high, you're, you're not gonna be protected. So as soon as you touch them, you're gonna start absorbing their sick energy. Okay, and when you got a sick client and a sick therapist, that's no help to anybody. So I think it's really important that people adopt energy practices. If you don't know where to start with that kind of stuff, by all means, drop me a line when this is done. And I can give you guys some recommendations. Uh, I know I'm very, very fortunate to all master here who uh, he teaches Tai Chi, Qigong, and he does seminars. If you're not interested in doing something that's a long-term commitment, uh, he just does seminars where you can go in for one day and learn a bunch of exercises. Uh, it's not for everybody. It requires a great deal of discipline. It is not easy. 
But from personal experience, when you're doing the practices, the more adamant you are about them, the more you start to feel. If you fall off and stop doing the practices and you feel a little bit less, and it's just kind of this battle constantly to keep practicing. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Qigong, but uh, I think we're running a little bit low on time. So I'd rather open up the floor to any questions anybody might have. But to sum everything up, guys, uh, our organs are hugely, hugely important to us. They're what's responsible for keeping us alive, for keeping us vital. We neglect them all the time. It's something that definitely needs to be addressed in treatment. And uh, I've started teaching courses on Chine Song because there's really nowhere I can find it here. I, I'm getting tired of flying to Thailand when I want some Chine Song uh, treatment. So I've started offering these courses to people. So people have a, an avenue of going and learning a little bit more about it. Uh, thanks, guys, for your time. And anybody who's got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, Andre, we've had a couple of people ask about scope. So I know we are short on time, but can you address that? We've had a number of therapists say, isn't this outside of our scope for our no. Ontario? Yes. So the answer to that question is no, it's not out of your scope. Uh, we do constipation treatments, right? So we're working already in the abdomen. Uh, the Anything that's accessible to you, you can work in treatment. So the, it's not out of our scope because we already learn treatments like this in school where we have the abdomen accessible to us. No massage that you do on the body is going to be out of your scope, really. Right. We're not we're not introducing needles to the body like in acupuncture. Um, so it's it's not anything that's out of our scope of practice. And also there's somebody on Facebook asking for information about where they can take your courses. So I don't know if you're going to leave any info. Oh, there it is. Thank you, sir. There you go. If you guys have, as, if there's anybody who has any questions for me day or night, I'm always available. <clears throat> Shoot me a line, text message, uh, go on my website, write me an email, whatever your, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, any questions, guys, even if you're not interested in taking courses, even if you're not interested in treatment, I, I'm a huge advocate for this profession and what I do. I absolutely love it. So I welcome any questions anybody has. Uh, and also, I'll just leave it at that. And, I'll just leave it at that.